Welcome, Kent Molgat, Jim Check, and joined right now with uh, Dan Albus, the MP for uh, Central Okanagan, Similkami Nicola. Did I get that right? You just rolled off the tongue. Better than some speakers <laughs> in the house. So uh, we've got a few topics we want to get to. I know that you've had a lot to say about affordability. So um, what is it that first comes to mind on this question that so many Canadians are facing right now? Well, it's I can't go to a coffee shop or stand in a grocery store lineup or a bank lineup without someone tapping me on the shoulder. And when you talk to them and say, you know, uh, you know, what's what's chief of mind? Everyone uh, has affordability concerns. So if you're a pensioner on fixed income, obviously, when you're going to the grocery store, uh, you're just asking yourself, how can I do this? And when you have cold snaps like we had uh, just recently, People are, are saying, you know, uh, what's that bill going to come do? And, of course, when you're, you're a parent and, and you're struggling, you know, just to, to make your mortgage payments and suddenly you're going, okay, how am I going to afford Christmas because we get uh, the Blue Monday, all those bills start coming due. Um, this issue is just what people are talking about at, uh, at, you know, at the water bottle at work. And what's really new for me, because, you know, pensioners, uh, it's, it's tough, especially if, you don't, if your pension is not linked uh, to uh, the CPI and, and and even old age security. Let's be mindful. It takes about a year or so before it actually catches up to what the price in, indexes are. So so seniors have been feeling, you know, behind the eight ball. Um, but there's it seems to me a new type of concern where these are many of the voters I think that Justin Trudeau tried to appeal to in 2015. Uh, you know, you know the middle class and those working hard to join it. Essentially, these are people that don't qualify for any government support. But what's happened because of higher interest rates, their mortgages have renewed or will soon be renewing. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're happy to have a home. But they're saying, I have a rising carbon tax. I have a rising property uh, tax. Uh, I don't feel like I'm getting any more value for money for that. And, you know, all these bills are coming due and how the heck am I going to do it? And even when, you know, I had someone, uh, you know, share with me their situation where, you know, they make okay money, and uh, but the housing costs are going to be too much. So they're looking, okay, I move. But where can I go? Uh, and they can't rent anywhere in Kelowna. Right now, the average uh, rent for a one-bedroom one, room, one bedroom apartment is uh, uh, 2187 across Canada. And so for a lot of people, relocating to another space, you know, will they find the right spot? Uh, and this, these are the, the, the questions. So people just are not feeling like they can afford to live. And, you know, that's, that's really where the government, uh, I think, you know, for a lot of people, and look, I'm an opposition politician, so I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, use my opportunity to press the government to, to work on the concerns I think my constituents have had, but you got to bear in mind, I'm a partisan, but I think this is where the government just feels like they are out to lunch and they're not really trying to address those concerns. And I think they've lost a lot of those young millennials. Okay. So you, uh, if, um, we wound up with a conservative government, you could work at whittling back some of those taxes that you mentioned, but is there anything substantial that, um, that a government could, could put into place to seriously dial back this housing affordability problem, which just seems to be a runaway train. So there's a couple of things can be done in affordability and some things do have shared jurisdiction. So look, housing is going to have a municipal part as local leadership is always important. Provincial because uh, the province ultimately you know, creates the, the, the municipalities and the rules they work under. And the federal government has some leadership, although we've, we've heard both sides from Justin Trudeau. Uh, you know, a few months ago, he tried saying uh, to Ottawa reporters that really it isn't a core responsibility of the federal government. But now uh, they're doing a little bit of a road show where they're doing, uh, they're shopping a, a housing accelerator fund and they're doing announcements. And for example, they were in Kelowna uh, not too long ago. And I think it was actually Kelowna Now that did a piece, a follow-up piece, where they actually don't know what they're going to do with that money. Uh, it's so, so, uh, kudos to, to, you know, to following through on that because this is the problem. They're doing announcements, but they're not necessarily building homes. And, uh, you know, when, when people say I've never sent more money to Ottawa, I've never seen a government so inclined to spend my money, but they're not seeing any, any change in their lives. But there's two, two sides to every issue. And, and one is the problem and one is the solution. Mm -hmm. And they're saying they're not really a big part of the solution, but are they not a big part of the problem with their immigration policy? When you let in 2 million people in the past two years, when we were only building 700,000 homes. And then I, I know that Pierre Polyev came out and said that he would link immigration to the capacity of homes being built. Cause wouldn't that 
from the federal level solve some of the issue with decreasing the amount of demand that's happening? So, so absolutely. And, and last week, uh, Sean Frazier was questioned specifically on his role because Sean Frazier is the current housing minister. But prior to the shuffle in, in the summer, he was the immigration uh, minister. And uh, a report was sent to, the immig- to uh, his department where they actually identified uh, that, uh, that they were out of sync with the amount of capacity of those homes. But look, we've known this has been a problem. David Eby, the premier, has raised this. Francis Legault in Quebec has raised this, and they've raised questions about Ottawa's, you know, one-size-fits-all, you know, we, we know best uh, policies, and there's they're publicly questioning that. In fact, Quebec said we are not going to be participating in certain uh, refugee programs uh, that, that are designed, uh, you know, because they don't feel that they have the space and the capacity in their healthcare system and, and, and with housing. And so when you have large provinces, like BC is the third largest province, Quebec is being the second, openly saying that you're not working with them, then you have to ask yourself, am, am I doing what's right for the country or am I just doing what, what seems to be right for them? Um, and again, it's, it's, there's, there's the immigration target that's set by Ottawa that's in the, uh, in the law. Every year, the, the minister does a report. Right now, they say that they've capped it at half a million people. But if you look at the people that are here on a temporary, so whether it be a work permit uh, or whether it be for study permit, it's almost uh, a million uh, more people. And so, uh, plus, a million plus. And so what ends up happening is people are saying, well, you know, isn't someone in charge of this? Yes. Uh, right now, uh, it's Justin Trudeau, and they have essentially uh, made the system unsustainable. It's not fair to new immigrants. It's not fair to refugees in Toronto that are sleeping outside. Uh, uh, Olivia Chow, the new mayor, uh, has been publicly you know, demanding the government to fix it, and they're talking about a large property tax increase because the federal government's not coming to the table. Um, this is where I think getting back to the water, uh, you know, water bottle conversation people are having, they're saying, you know, it, it doesn't seem like anyone's in charge. It doesn't seem, it seems that they're adrift. And this is where my leader, Pierre Polyev, has been talking about common sense things, linking the amount of people that come into this country to, to the, the housing capacity, because we want people to come and thrive here. We want people to be able to come here and be able to, to add to our economy. We also want them to have a family doctor, which we know 6 million Canadians don't. Mm-hmm. We also want them to be able to fully participate in, in the economy and, uh, and be able to get a home. And right now, if you talk to most millennials, they're talking about leaving, uh, whether it be British Columbia for other places like Alberta. I have family uh, members that have left uh, the province. Uh, so, I, and, and it's specifically affordability. Okay, so beyond linking uh, immigration to housing availability, could you imagine that being taken one step further and link it to the availability of uh, medical care? access to physicians well could, uh, it, could it be brought back even further than that well so so this is the this is the thing ken uh, my, my leader has been talking about a blue seal program for across canada and that's to, because right now we have tens of thousands of doctors and even more nurses that are coming to canada immigrating legally uh going through all the paperwork process and then they go to the provincial organization that credentials them and they're waiting for years, if not, uh, and being told, "Sorry, we don't, we, we don't, you, we're, we're not going to uh, admit your paperwork right. as it is." And so, we've seen uh, provincially they've they've somewhat changed their approach, but we need to have it right across Canada. So, a blue seal program, where essentially like a red seal for the trades, you would have a blue seal program for. Uh, for doctors, nurses, and healthcare practitioners uh, that are designated and, and have it so they can move quickly. It, it, it sh- it's nuts that we don't allow people that have the requisite, requisite skills to be there from Ontario. A nurse from Ontario should be able to practice in BC like that. And, uh, you know, there's been some promising things here provincially, but we don't see it across the board in Canada. And that's where I think my leader is doing the best work is he's basically saying, what's common sense? And it, it has been where Justin Trudeau has tried to use the, the, the umbrella, oh, that's not under our, our jurisdiction, it's the provinces. Well, I don't think people care about that. That National Bank of Canada report that came out a couple of days ago, we did a good story on it yesterday. It's pretty damning. Like, it's, it pretty much says they had the information two years ago, ignored the information, and then put us kind of in this thing, and it seems like the right hand doesn't talk to the left hand, or maybe they don't care. I'm not sure what the, what the logic is, but... The Bank of Canada also came out and said the same thing. Like all, you know, letting in this many people actually drives inflation, actually drives and it strains housing, which mm-hmm. is and energy. Obviously, the, the big things that people have in their 
budgets is their housing, whether they're renting or paying a mortgage, and driving up interest rates as well has strained a lot of people. Um, energy, putting carbon taxes on in the time when, when, especially we have this cold snap here, people are probably not even turning up their heat, right? Because they don't believe they can pay for their heat. And then I've heard stories like horror stories in the last little while, people waiting in the hospital 30, 40 hours just just to, to see in an emergency room, just to see a doctor. Like, we definitely need some common sense where we start saying, hey, we can't continue to stress our systems to the detriment of even the people that come here. And, and I'm pro-immigrant. My, my mom and dad escaped the Hungarian Revolution. That was one of our big influxes in 1957, I think. And again, you know, like when we have people coming under stressful situations, but we definitely need to have some controls. And so it sounds like to me you're saying the conservatives would put some controls into place? Well, again, it's common sense. Uh, we want to make sure that new Canadians, when they come to this country, can thrive. We also want to make sure that people uh, have faith in their institutions, that they're not just simply, again, an Ottawa knows best policy that Mr. Trudeau seems to, uh, you know, that, that's all they do is they, 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 they'll say that they're consulting, but ultimately they ram through uh, different targets and different, uh, without, without consulting with provinces. Well, one and th- provinces should be partners not punching bags. There's a, there's a chart there. I guess we don't have it to show up there, but like that, that looks crazy. Okay, but let me just, you know, I, I'm not going to defend the amount of immigration we've seen over the last few years. Clearly, it's looking like a big mistake right now, but I just want to take us back a year and a half or so where we were seeing all over the place um, businesses having to cut back on their opening hours or close because they couldn't get staff. Mm-hmm. To, so it's right. not like they were bringing... But we did have an issue it's, that that It's not like COVID, we brought right? in too uh, many immigrants for no reason, is my point. Like, there there are other forces. There are uh, jobs that are hard to fill without lots of immigrants. Well, again, we have where the federal government, this federal government, has brought in doctors and nurses who intend to live and work and, and, and help people in, 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 in from representing very small communities like Merritt uh, that ha- often have closures of their emergency room. Yeah. This, is, this has been major for them. Uh, so the problem that we, what we see right now is they'll admit people and then they'll just leave them on a queue. There's no assistance yeah. to get them where their credentials are accessed. So, you know, again, this is, comes back to my earlier point. They talk a lot. They say that we're, we're going to build housing here in Kelowna. But no one actually knows what the project is and what the priorities are. And when you start scratching under the surface, that's all they're doing is making announcements and they're not actually delivering results. So this is where, again, my leader's been focused on the issues where Canadians uh, want to see more more, uh, done. But going back to the Bank of Canada, look, uh, the person who's in a home right now, we have a number of people that are going to be renewing their mortgages this year. I, I heard the uh, Royal Bank of Canada economists speak about this. They have a big part of their book that's going to be coming up this year and next. It's going to be much higher rates than what people originally paid. What's, what's that mean? Well, he says most people will pay it, but then there's not that extra money in the back of their jeans where they can go out and go to a, one of our local small businesses. So what's going to happen is you're going to see uh, more money going to banks to pay off the higher interest rates and less money to invest in your local community and, and on disposable income. And a, again, and if you talk to a macroeconomic, uh, someone who's an economist in, in the macro stuff, right now, every time the government spends an extra dollar on deficits, and they, they've upped it again $60 billion in their last statement, $60 more billion is going to be spent. That makes the Bank of Canada's job harder. And in fact, a number of, uh, of banks, including Nova Scotia, has said, you know, it's about a point, uh, it's about a, a full point to a point and a half higher in, uh, inflation, which means that uh, there's going to be uh, more pain for those people. So look, you know, the answer here is let's get rid of the made in Canada inflation. So one of them is let's, uh, let's reduce the government deficits. Let's get rid of inflationary carbon taxes that just get piled on to, to each other as people ship products. Again, if you tax the farmer, uh, that makes the food and you tax the person that, that drives the food to market, uh, then eventually that's going to get passed on. These are the inflationary policies that need to stop. Right. But I mean, uh, you mentioned before, you know, take this from a partisan, you know, you're in opposition. But to be talking about, uh, you know, cutting back on these taxes and reducing the deficit, you're really painting yourself into a corner trying to do both those things at once. Well, obviously, something's got to give. Well, look, th- this is a government that has never found, like, Last year, there was uh, in the public accounts, the government had a $150 million loan 
or not loan, a $150, $150 million payment to an unknown company under the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada. They gave them $150 million. They just wrote it off saying it's a bad contract. So the press asked questions about that. They weren't given any answers from officials. So when the officials came to committee, we asked the questions. So it was Medicago, and it was for vaccines, vaccines that were never given to the government of Canada. And the way the contract was written, the, the officials actually said, we, we, we deemed it un, that we couldn't collect it back. So you have a government that is spending $150 million, never got what they, what they intended to be uh, to paid for, and then wrote it off without trying to recollect it. So you just imagine that on every single scale. And for example, $16 billion is, is what they're saying the Volkswagen electric um, battery plants is going, going to cost. Will they show us the contract? No. What, do we know if, if something happens to the market like it has in uh, the European Union where they've actually shuttered some of their Volkswagen battery plant production? Uh, is there any contingencies for that? We don't know. And so the, the thing is, is that we see more money and more promises being made. And we have, uh, and we don't know uh, if, if the government is really looking after us on these kinds of contracts. Because so far, uh, on that $150 million, didn't look like they even tried let, to get the Let's segue with accountability because we've we got a few things we want to get to. Yes. And let's talk about accountability. Uh, you, you sent in a, a piece the other day on um, Justin Trudeau's vacation that close to $100,000. Um, that was kind of like on December 22nd, I believe, he, he made an announcement that said he put it through the Ethics Commission and they said it was A-OK and that he was staying with a friend. And then we learned later that it was, that it's actually at a resort owned by a friend. And then it turns out that it was a close to $100,000. And then you, you had some thoughts on it. So this, there's an inquiry right now or, or they're going to yeah, talk so, about it? So the, they've, they've uh, agreed, I believe, this morning in Ottawa where they, the Ethics Committee will hear from the uh, acting um, Ethics Commissioner. Uh, and that's, so that's a very good step. But I, I just, before we go any further on this, you said that Justin Trudeau had it cleared ahead of time. Brian Lilly from Sun News actually had it confirmed in writing from the Ethics Commissioner. That's not how the law works. Uh, you, you don't get a proactive, uh, you know, this is fine. That's the announcement you know, that was made. I, I know, I know. And this, this is where the original announcement when uh, Justin Trudeau's spokesperson for the Prime Minister's office said to the media that he was actually covering the cost uh, of, of the stay in Jamaica. Then they actually publicly backtracked and said, well, it was a family friend that offered it. And again, 84000 plus uh, because it's, a, it's like a $9,000 a night place. Uh, it sounds very nice. I, you know, right. uh, I'm sure many Canadians would wish they had friends like that. But at the end of the day, this is a commercial operation. This is not just someone's private home. It's a commercial it operation. There's, there's a market value for what it right. is. And yet, and, and, and when the uh, Prime Minister and some of his ministers, including Stephen McKinnon, uh, who, by the way, Stephen McKinnon's taken over as the House Leader. Congratulations, Stephen. Big job. Uh, but when that, but, but he actually said, well, it was all cleared. That's not the case. And so this is where having the ethics commissioner come forward. And, and, and I just will say, it seems that ha this happens every year. We end up talking about Justin Trudeau. It's almost like he doesn't care. Uh, because at the end of the day, and it's something I wrote in my MP report, this is the highest office. He has the most resources. He should be able to talk to a lawyer in-house and be able to say, you know, should I be able to take this? Will there? And, and under our guidelines, conflict of interest there's two types. There's actual conflict of interest where you've broken the law right. and perceived. Right. Right. And so this, again, you know, from, from liberals always saying hand on heart that they want to build up our institutions. You know, for, to have the highest uh, office, you know, first of all, pretend that they're, say, publicly that it was cleared and publicly that it was paid for. And right. then and back and forth between these two or two or three opposing stories, like, I can't keep up yep. yet. Well, help me through this a little bit. Is there something in accepting this um, benefit from the owner of this resort? that you see compromising uh, it's perceived conflict of interest here's the here's the guidelines actually from uh, ChatGPT on Canadian politicians conflict of interest and this is where it falls gifts or benefits receiving gifts or benefits that could be seen as influencing a politician's decisions or actions is generally considered a conflict of interest it's, it doesn't have to be an actual conflict of interest. It has to be a perceived conflict right. of interest. No, but I'm just wondering what... Uh, do you, what would $93,000 alter your decision-making? Well, I don't have $93,000 uh, 
It doesn't really resolutions matter though. Being offered to me. I, I don't yeah. think it's a, I don't think we should act like it's a big discovery that uh, Trudeau is a very has a very privileged family who has who has friends that have things that my friends don't. So that's not a big revelation. But I, I just wanted to drill a little deeper as to what could be the perceived uh, conflict well, of look, interest. Look, at, the, at the end of the day, when you're a public office holder, like the Prime Minister, you have an obligation to the public to not only be seen to follow the letter of the law. Right. And he, an you know what? The exemption for a friend has been raised several times. Yeah. Not to this level. Um, but again, this was a commercially... A commercial right. operation with a market value rate that was that was assessed at uh, close to nine thousand dollars a night. Right. That kind of opulence is a lot, and you would think that someone, either the prime minister or someone on his team, would say, "You know what, prime minister, we need to be seen not just to be following the letter right. of the law, but the spirit of it." And that's why I think is disappointing here. It is ultimately is there you 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 have it where the prime minister chose this line. Now, I don't know the whole backstory. He has not come forward to say it. Mm-hmm. All I can simply hope, though, is having the ethics commissioner come forward and talk about yeah. this thing might might we might draw some more light to it. I, I think, as as regular Canadians looking at it, and as an an accountant as well, if I was looking at it and if I was doing an audit on for the company, I would definitely like bring it oh. forward as a conflict of interest. I couldn't not bring it forward by saying that oh, you know, a rich person. Uh, it it depends on that. That that seems really kind of like um, silly, right? Because. Ninety-three thousand dollars is a lot of money, no matter how you look at it, right? Yeah. Because it's it's not. Well, he's got millions of dollars. Well, then he should be able to afford his own vacation, right? He shouldn't be taking, right? Because anytime we take something, life's a, a transaction, no matter. Well, what that's life, what right? I'm, life's is, a transaction. Has anyone right? suggested so, what the uh, quid pro quo well, is? Well, doesn't here? have to be though, Ken. It's it's a perceived conflict. It's not. There ha- does not have to be the other end of the transaction. So I, I'm not saying that this isn't a longtime family friend. That's that's not for me to decide. Um, I'm not saying that, uh, it, like, again, t- to Jim's point, in any other v- vocation, someone would say this is an enormous amount of money yep. for a market amount. Someone is, see, literally, the friend is giving up a commercial activity mm-hmm. in favor of a friend. Yeah. Um, now, to me, it just, to me, it seems just mind-blowing that someone, though, who is a public official who, you know, needs to show, kind of lead uh, from the top yeah. uh, to show that kind of that kind of leadership to me that to, to not pass this is, is and, to me is and especially is an since this is not the first time right yep. this is not the first time this has come across because I remember it was a couple of years ago I said oh you know whoops um, I'm gonna hire my own ethics advisor that will make sure I don't get into trouble again yeah, yeah. well but again this is the thing is is that Justin Trudeau will say things hand on heart and then you find out they'll just keep doing it again and again this this is not this is not a New criticism. This is a serial criticism yep. of just how they govern. So and let's let's move on again. So we won't get stuck there either. Kent has a topic that he wants to bring up because he said he spoke with a reporter today. Well, I just ran into some from the CBC, and I know that they're wondering, you know, what uh, thing, what their world might look like um, under a conservative government. What what should the CBC employee look forward to? Well, my my leader's been very clear. He's looking to defund the CBC. Uh, now I don't have uh, necessarily the you know ten steps that go along with that because when you get in government, uh, if you're going to be making an, you know any major decision, there's going to be things that need to be looked at. But I, I think it's essentially the, you know the leader ran on that in his leadership campaign, got a strong seventy percent. Uh, of the membership that voted, voted in favor of him. So I think he has a very strong mandate, and he's been very publicly vocal, even when he's been here in the Okanagan, has, has said this. So I think that that's part of it. And the, and as a public official, uh, I always listen to people, uh, what they have to say on this. Uh, you know, it, you must it, be hearing from a lot of people who have grown up with the CBC. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I got to tell you, Kent, the CBC today for a lot of people is not what it used to be. Now, whether that be because of mismanagement, I'll leave it to people that know better on it. But uh, again, there's there's some incredible work that's done. But as an organization, um, I will tell you that uh, it, people just don't feel, especially when you have, and this be mindful, that millennials are now the largest voting bloc. They have not grown up with Mr. Dress Up, right? It, 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 is a, it is a different thing because they essentially are saying, okay, I'm putting, giving money to Ottawa for something that I never use. 
And for a lot of them that are just scraping by, and many millennials have two or three jobs just to try to, you know, keep themselves and pay down their student debt. Uh, you know, for them, so, they, they may not say that that's so, a priority for them. So anymore. you see defunding the CBC as uh, that, that it works politically, that you'll get more s- support for that than you would opposition on that. So so as a public official, I'm always listening and I'm happy to answer questions to the extent that I I know. Uh, But I also will tell you that's what elections are for. Right. Right. And I I will tell you that I've I've heard prominent voices. I think Peter Mansbridge, I think he does his daily podcast, has been very critical, uh, you know, uh, of 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 how the CBC has been managed. So there's a difference between the institution and and, and where it was that maybe that, you know, uh, people your age, my age, uh, and older would say, you know, uh, you know, the, the, you know, when uh, uh, you know when the national came on, everyone watched. That's not the case anymore. And in fact, uh, let's be mindful too that there's lots of other media that uh, works really, really hard to produce great content, and they're out. The CBC is competing for the same web dollars uh, with that company. That's and, for sure. and I'm going to jump in there. Yeah, that's I, that's Jim's cue. Because. I grew up with CBC, and I and I think CBC is one of Canada's institutions, or was at least. And I believe the RCMP and, and the CBC were. And I believe we, as a taxpayer, pay the CBC. It's not Justin that, that's giving them money. It's us, the taxpayer, that provides money. But I don't believe in this last little while, I'd say five or six years, that I've noticed that, that they're no longer the voice of the people. And that's what I think is... is for a lot of people I speak to, that the CBC has lost its way and that they're not the voice of the people, that they seem to have a different purpose lately. And um, I, I, there's, I mean, I grew up with all the beachcombers and all that stuff, and I thought it was great that what they used to do, and it kind of like helped to have that influence here where we used to get all that American television. We only had that one station that brought us Canadian content, but I believe most people are watching Netflix and like what you're saying now, they're watching Disney and Netflix and, and Crave and all these other channels, and the CBC is not as relevant in that respect anymore because it, it's not doing that. I believe CBC has a role. I think Hockey Night in Canada is, is an institution as well, but that's not even on the CBC anymore, right? So, so Well, but, you know, I, again, it goes with these things. Like, look, the market has changed so dramatically. Look, look at journalism today. It has changed so dramatically. People get their news in a completely different way than they once did. And so I, I, I think with this latest, uh, with the millennials, you know, it doesn't speak to them perhaps the same way previous generations had. Now, I'm not saying that those, uh, you know, that there isn't excellent programming on. Uh, I, I think that there, 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 you can point out uh, by your taste what things you do like and what you don't like. But so far, when you have voices, uh, prominent voices, uh, saying that the CBC uh, hasn't hasn't been able to build a, a, and retain uh, a, a view, viewership for some of its, uh, you know, biggest programs. You, you, cut, you start to say, right. okay, should we be giving more money uh, to, to what people consider to be, a, a, you know, an institution that is, doesn't speak to them or isn't, doesn't to generate what they would view the value to them? This is happening at a time when, you know, companies that have invested in journalism are unstable. We see black press uh, filing for bankruptcy protection. So, so yeah, so let, let's talk so, about funding, though, because we get zero. And I've talked to you about this mm-hmm. before. We get zero. Um, we fall through all the cracks and everything. And then, but we figured out a model that works for us and we were very good in our social footprint. And then when they came and did Bill C-18, it really kind of kneecaps us, right? Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? Cause we've lost so many contracts that people come and say, well, you lost your biggest strength. And so, you know, we, we have, you know, until you get it back, we have, you know, like we're going to pause all our interactions yep. with Clona. And Clona now has been like, we have some of the best reporters. I believe Kent is one of the best reporters in, in, in the Valley, and I believe Steve McNall, who has 35 plus years, and uh, to take away one of our strengths with Bill C-18, which seems to make no sense, Kamloops this week went under, and mm-hmm. they said right in their press release, the yes. reason we're going under is because of Bill C-18. Black Press now making an announcement yesterday, I think it was yesterday, saying yep. that uh, they're basically going into uh, bankruptcy protection, which is, you know, we don't know what that means at the end of the day. Um, it's not good. Not good. So how do, like, I believe journalism is so important, obviously, because we're running a, a company, and I believe what we do here, and I think, you know, like, I think people like Kent, to some bigger organizations, isn't as useful because he doesn't have the tech that some of the younger people have, but I believe he has knowledge that is far outweighs all that tech stuff, and that's why we, you know, have people like Kent and Steve McDowell here, too, along with some of the younger people. Actually, we probably have one of the most experienced newsrooms in 
in Kelowna, and yet we're we're said we're not journalists, and uh, yeah. it's 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 tough to swallow when it seems to be that it's politically motivated as opposed to because if there was guidelines and we read through the guidelines ian who's a very good reporter has read through all the guidelines so yeah we should we should qualify for some of these credits yet we don't so it's it's frustrating as all yeah. get out right well so, yeah. so essentially my, my leader's been talking about you know the gatekeepers and gatekeeping that happens that stops canadians from building things at home well it, it's not just building things it's also creating things and so this essentially by choosing uh, you know, to increase subsidies to, to you know, uh, places like the CBC in choosing, uh, you know, to regulate, uh, you know, uh, Netflix and, and, and whatnot, and, and, and essentially adding C-18. The government's made, it, to me, very clear that they favor institutional favorites. Mm-hmm. It feels and, like they're choking independent and, media. And, 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 and essentially by that, instead of, in, instead of saying, you know what, we're not gonna we're not gonna put our thumb on this, and we're gonna let the market sort it out. We're gonna allow new entrants to come in with new uh, ideas and, and new offerings, and let them win on that 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 battlefield for for that uh, for people's attention. Um, essentially, our gatekeeping because they're saying no, we don't view you, even despite you know uh, your uh, your arguments that uh, Kent and others you know are legitimate journalists. Which I just for the record, I believe that well, uh, he's Kent's done you know been around for a long time, and he knows he knows what he's doing. He asks tough questions and in fair ways. But then you also get uh, C-18, which essentially, just so people know what it does, is it basically made the incentives for uh, Facebook and others to say, you know what, we're not going to be in the market of allowing people to share links because they say that that is somehow taking uh, the content that was offered on the web freely and availably uh, and, and, and forces groups like Meta to make payments to uh, to uh, whether it be to a government agency or to the to the different uh, groups themselves, and and essentially they just said no, we're not going to offer Canadian news anymore. So what- and and so essentially now you cut, it's cut off a major revenue because you know again eyes and links equal dollars. So, so what's extremely frustrating about it, mm-hmm. in its common sense, we along with CBC and CTV and Global, all those big outlets and lots of independent media. We willingly put our stuff on Facebook. They never stole content from us. We put it there on purpose. Like, we have to post it because they don't take content. They only take what you put there. And for us, it's a symbiotic relationship, right? We put it there, and it drives us traffic. And that's what it's done for many other places. And and you can see the people are losing the traffic. And during the fires, we've seen the community kind of say, like, hey, we've lost access to good information because a lot of people are consuming their content like that. So it's also caused some... You know, security or, or safety issues, too, in local communities. And we're a local media outlet that, that's trying really hard. And Bill C-18, and here's the oddest part about it, including the journalism credit. It's a CRA program, but it's being administered by a newspaper group outside of CRA. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's well, again, the that, gate, it's a political body. But, but there's a there's a gatekeeper. Well, again, the yeah. government has decided a political decision to say we're going to let this body decide, and they get to a point who those people are, and so they've made that, those choices because personnel is policy, and they're deciding who they view as legitimate and who's not, and uh, you know that's that's I think is is because ultimately you end up, you know, when I talk to journalists, I say, well, tell me what a journalist is. They can often tell me what a journalist isn't. Um, because they don't want to be too fine of it. And they also don't want, and to some extent, gov- they don't want government saying you're official, you're not. Uh, right. Because in a free society, um, you know, I don't think governments should be defined okay, what journalism Okay, there was a question is. I was starting to ask five minutes ago, and, yeah. and Jim, I agree 100% on what you said, but I got slightly derailed. I mean, what's happening with Kelowna now is all part of it. But there's great instability in the journalism that people have come to rely on right now. I mean, with black press disappearing, who knows what else happens? Mm-hmm. Is this the right time to be beating up on the CBC when who knows who's left standing after all of this uh, carnage? Well, uh, well, you know, like, like, and I'm just, I'm just questioning whether or not that policy makes sense given we're at a time when people are wondering who to rely on for their information. Look, you know what? We, I've been very critical on, on the government for a lot of its spending, and uh, you know, the CBC is is part of that. It's a legitimate discussion to have of how much should go towards these things. And these are not new arguments. Um, the, the, the thing, though, is, is that I, I think in, in, in the discussion we're having here, it's more of who is, you know, who's benefiting by government policy. Right now, I would say 100% it's the incumbents. 
uh, because they are gatekeeping who gets access to the labor tax credit. They are gatekeeping. Uh, they're, they're, they're essentially like CBC will be receiving a chunk of the money that uh, the, the deal with Google. Right. Uh, because Google has come up with a deal to, 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 to get past the C-18 issues, even though I, I don't see how. And they're the ones uh, that actually steal content. Well, and the law is pretty clear. I, it, I don't think it, it necessarily allows, but somehow the government has said in the regulations they're going to make this happen. But they're actually not only going to make CBC part of that. They're, 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 CBC also receives extra money as part of its public subsidy. So, you know, I think, quite honestly, the more money that goes towards the CBC, the more of a target it is, and the more questions should be asked, and that's a fair thing. I, I, I have no, I, should, I, should I just want to say, my, I have no animosity <laughs> towards answering anyone's questions. I'm I qualify I, my yeah. Google comment in saying, steal, they, they definitely take, they scrape the web and take content, right? Whether or not they define it as like that. But Facebook doesn't take content. Facebook is content we actually put there, right? We don't put our content on Google. Exactly. It just shows up there because because yeah. they have a crawler that goes out there and finds content. Right? But again, whether you be a new YouTuber uh, like w- within Canada, yeah. where you know, and again, this is the thing: is the YouTubers don't have a lobbyist. They're just independently creating great Canadian media on their own, uh, and now suddenly under uh, some of the government legislation around discoverability, they 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 may get pushed down to the to the bottom, while certain content gets pushed to the top. And I think that when we're talking about gatekeepers, when we're talking about public money, is is that the wisest use of those those scarce tax dollars, or should we should we just accept that we have the internet? The internet is blown open up, uh, you know, where someone can have thousands of channels if they so want. The- uh, and 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 you know what? And should we be trying to keep a, a, a broadcasting framework and apply that to the internet that was created in the '60s and '70s? I just, I just, to me, yeah. it's, 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 it's a bit of a fantasy land yeah. to try to yeah. try to stuff I, that in. I think I kind of agree. It seems like the information world is something that is happening to us, and we can try to guide it, but it's almost right. futile. It seems like it's so subjective that it definitely is purposely selective of who gets the money, and that's kind of what you're saying. The incumbents get it. It's, it seems at this point like like we have a knee on our throat as independent media and many media outlets, and and we have little recourse or any like we can't phone facebook like we can't phone facebook and and because they don't answer the phone there's nobody there right and then i don't think they have we've, a we've tried with the heritage minister we've we've asked that they want to talk and they don't want to talk to us so when we talk to you then mm-hmm. but um let's leave that there for now because we're not going to solve it, it today yeah we're gonna we're gonna finish up here uh, Kent doesn't want to do this, I'm sure. That's what he's probably well, doing. I want a chance to talk to Dan Elvis? <laughs> no, this, me? this next question oh, we're going to talk one. about. <laughs> oh, the, I, the Trump stories really trigger me. So there's, a, so there's a poll that was put out, and I think most of the major outlets have carried it. It says two-thirds of Canadians believe a Trump win threatens the U.S. democracy. What, what is your thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, again, when you phone Canadians and uh, w- when it's a poll, people whether whether you're getting a great sample or not, I'm not 1510 sure. Fifteen hundred and ten people. So, so look, so like important. at the end of the day, I try to focus on things I can control. Like, yeah. and and you know, and who the Americans choose. And let's let's say that first of all, the, the American uh, economy is the biggest in the world, and uh, and also its uh, politics seems to be uh, you know the biggest in the world too. And so I try to focus on the areas in my own uh, right. member's office to focus on the things I can change, and that's usually talking about my I, I just found the okay, statement kind of weird. This is says, the wording. The exact yeah. wording was um, that 64% say U.S. democracy cannot survive another four years of Donald Trump. I am the furthest from a Trump supporter as you are going to find. I could see U.S. democracy being damaged I mean, it's, but it's it a will silly not statement. survive. It's that's, a that, silly, that silly statement. That might be some hyperbole. Right? I mean, who knows? It's possible that it would be it, they'd come out of that not even a democracy anymore. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It seems like a bit much. Anyway. Well, well but yeah, anyway, I, I think it never hurts to ask someone their opinion. But again, yeah. uh, like I, I, I say to people on a regular basis, I have around 115, maybe 120,000 bosses. And uh, for me to be able to to figure out what each one of them, you know, each one will have their own opinion. And, and I think things. that's so, one, one of the things that Paul that's why we have democracy. That, that resonates with me is that he believes he's a servant of the people. Where I think some politicians in the world don't believe that anymore. I, I think they they think the opposite. And I think Ronald Reagan said it really well: is that the government should be scared of the people, not the people scared of the government. And that was a really good speech by our friend Ronald Reagan. Someone says to you, "What do you think of Donald Trump?" 
What do you think of Donald Trump? Well, I say I, I don't think of American politics that often. I you know, I, look, I, I try to understand Canadian politics. That's a and, real non-answer, Dan. Oh, well, <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, you have a choice. Every day you put your, you know, you tie your shoes on and you go out there and you say, what can I do? to objectively make life better for my constituents. And you know what? Uh, there's lots of, if, if, if it was a hobby of mine, maybe I, I might be able to do that. But yeah. most of my time is spent trying to say, okay, what what can we do, uh, you know, to make life better for my constituents? And right now, affordability is the key one. Um, and it, like I said, this is not just where it's a small group of people. You know, pensioners are feeling the pinch. Uh, young people are feeling indebted and they feel that they're locked out of the, uh, of the housing market. People in the housing market feel that they're locked into a high cost trajectory that they don't know if they can sustain. So like that, that's where my thoughts are at. So sorry guys. So, so carbon tax, we'll end here with carbon tax. Um, and this, and a little bit of a segue, it seems like the federal government seems to be at odds with many of the provinces recently. Like we have uh, Scott Moe in Saskatchewan saying that they're not going to pay the carbon tax. I don't know where that's going to shake out. Mm -hmm. We have Danielle Smith um, taking energy from um, BC and and Saskatchewan this past week, um, also saying that the the plan by, I can't probably pronounce his name, Stefan Gibault. Yeah, um, Stephen Gibault. Stephen Gibault, um, that his his requirements are just not feasible. Alberta will not have the power to do that by 2030. And then we have, like, other provinces that are definitely, like you're saying, Quebec, they're saying they're not going to take people. So we have so much discontent between the provinces. Even even uh, David Eby, when when uh, Justin cut the carbon tax for Atlantic Canada, and he said it felt like he got stabbed in the back by by the federal government. How do like? I look at the, the federal government as supposed to be a working partner with the provinces. Isn't that what it's supposed to be? Well, again, C-69, core, that, that was the no new, bu- new pipelines bill. And it also had mining and, and other energy projects that were into it. Uh, large amounts of that were ruled unconstitutional. Uh, I think the clean electricity regulations that Daniel Smith is contesting uh, from uh, on high from, from Ottawa is, is the same kind of ilk. The, the, I've never seen a, a federal government so intent on invading into provincial legislation. And I think it does so just, just so that we'll, 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 we'll talk about them. But again, uh, these things end up going to court. They create huge uncertainty for, for the businesses that are involved. And then at the end of the day, if they get uh, either way, a huge amount of taxpayer money on both sides gets spent. And, uh, and you end up where instead of working with one another, and again, I go back to, you know, provinces should be partners, not punching bags. You know, if you have one level of government that is basically casting costs onto another with no appreciation for for the regime that that, that has developed over a long period of time uh and or what the costs were uh you know that's that's an incredible issue it's an interesting thing on like on on carbon tax for british columbia um because of the you know climate change is being used as a political kind of like baton but it was it was the the, well, the Liberal Party back then, or whatever it's called now, BC United, they're the ones that brought in carbon tax. So just getting back to the carbon tax, and you mentioned the carve-out that was given recently for, for those on home heating oil. So essentially almost two-thirds of the people that would benefit of this are, are concentrated in Atlanta, Canada. So that's why a lot of people just openly said this. And, and they actually said, we're doing this because people have affordability concerns. So wait a second, you know, uh, BC has its own regime. It also has a carbon tax on home heating oil, and especially particularly on the island. So suddenly they're saying, we're going to give people a break uh, from a, a federal policy because we know it's making life less affordable. And, and, and yet here in BC, people are saying, well, what about us? And, and this is, this is the, the I, I think you're, you're actually seeing the carbon price or the, the, the carbon tax, uh, you know, uh, is unwinding in front of our eyes. Why? It's because, as we've always said, it creates made-in-Canada inflation. It makes us less competitive. And right now we're experiencing a time of high inflation. And yet people are seeing every year, whether it be their natural gas bill, their propane bill, uh, whether it be on their diesel at, at the pump, or uh, just regular gas, they're seeing that, that go up, and it's supposed to quadruple, right? That, that's what the federal government has planned. By 2030, their people are going to be paying four times the amount, and people are barely getting by right now. So that's why they're finally seeing the light when it comes to affordability and offering carve-outs, but only for those that benefit from it. And so that, this is where you see provinces, like even Manitoba has said, 
Uh, and that's an NDP premier, Wab Kanu. He's, he's been elected. He's actually said we want to be exempted from the carbon tax too because we think we've put in the, the investments to make us uh, clean and green. And w- we don't think the carbon tax is making life more affordable. In fact, they were reducing taxes uh, in, in Manitoba. So I think where this comes down to is, is that the federal liberals knew from day one that their carbon tax uh, would, would cost more and more. And they've been able to cover a lot of this by saying we'll give more money back. But people aren't seeing it. And again, the unfairness, if you heat your home and it's negative 30 out, if you heat your home with propane and natural gas, and somehow someone in Atlantic Canada is using home heating oil, one is getting, uh, you know, uh, getting a, a carve out and the other one isn't. And that's, and that's negative 30. That's to keep, you know, people alive and mm-hmm. warm. That's not, that's not fair. Clumsy at best, the way they rolled that out, without foreseeing all these regional issues that would arise. Definitely. Now it's, now it's been, become divisive, and the goal Especially is one of the comments by one of the MPs and said, we well, should you should, invite, you should uh, elect more liberals. Yeah, I'm about to <laughs> turn into a pumpkin. We should probably thank... <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to do one last thing. Dan made an announcement that he's running again. Obviously, we, we expected that as well. Well, it, it's funny you should mention this, because, uh, and I wrote this in my MP report, uh, I, I received a lot of sincere... Uh, emails, uh, et cetera, saying congratulations, uh, best on your retirement. And it's not me that's retiring. It's actually Dan <laughs> Ashton who shares an office with me in Summerland. Really? Uh, so funny. Uh, you know, and I've, I actually, the funny thing is that I started off as a, when he was mayor as, as a counselor with Dan. So we've, we've always had this issue where sometimes yeah. someone would send me an email that was meant to go to him and vice versa. You can just answer them. Uh, and so what I do is I just say that's very kind, but it's actually Dan Ashton, MLA, who's <laughs> retiring from provincial <laughs> politics. And uh, so, so I, I just thought that when I hear this a, a few times from, from different people in different parts of the right, I said, maybe I better make this clear. I think that there's never been a greater appetite for change in our riding. I, and I, I believe that Pierre Polyev will do a, a fantastic job as prime minister. And so I'm reoffering. That's what the, the Atlantic re-offering. Canada, that's what they call it. And I, I think that's it. Okay. Reoffering uh, whenever the next election is, because I do think that, uh, that uh, there's a lot to be said and a lot of work to be done on these very important issues. We had Dan McTeague on. Uh, you probably know he was a yep. liberal uh, MP for a number of years, uh, also with a gas buddy or a gas wizard. Um, and he said that uh, he expects uh, Justin Trudeau to resign in the February liberal uh, meeting and that there'll be an election here in, uh, in the fall of, of this year. Well, hey, you know. You guys are always ready, I imagine. Well, well when you have a minority, absolutely. You probably um, want Trudeau to stay on because... You know, he's a popular punching bag for conservatives, right? Do you want to, or would you, well, do you, do you care? Look, you know, at the end of the day, if someone offers themselves for election, they should do it because they feel that they can be effective and that they enjoy what they do. If Justin Trudeau, I don't think is very effective, but if he doesn't enjoy it anymore, get out of it and let someone else take over the reins. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're ready for an election anytime. My leader is not taking anything for granted. The temperature may have gone down, but if, if you just look at his social media, he's all through northern Ontario uh, and, and Quebec. Uh, he'll be in B.C. next week and not just in, in the big centers. He'll be in a lot of areas, uh, you know, uh, up north. So, you know, at, 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 you know, just but the biggest thing here is, is again, um, you know, it's, it's because and it's not just a small group. Everyone who I, I speak to is feeling concern over over the christmas holidays i wouldn't believe like i I have a a few family members some are very well off and and make very good money and they were complaining about the price of grocery and i said if if you're complaining about the price of grocery and you make good money like i can only imagine you know some of the people uh that that i haven't heard from uh but you know again pensioners um people that are working two or three jobs people that just recently you know lost their home uh because they they, you know the landlord says i i want to have a family member move in where are they going to go? And these are the challenges people are facing. I, I was at a gas pump uh, a while back, and uh, a very well-to-do uh, person was filling up his one-ton diesel truck, and then he reached because I had a at that time I had one as well, and he looked over at me saying, you know, it was like two hundred and fifty bucks or something like that to fill it up, and he looked over to me and he started grumbling about, you know, like, hey, this is you know like BS that this is costing this much, and I said, hey, you know what you should think about, the thing about the people that are choosing whether to put gas in their vehicle yeah. or not buying groceries today. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and think about it that way. Cause to you, it's an irritation yeah. to them. It's a choice they're making for their family. There are people that are in utter distress 
And if they don't see some sort of hope in the window, and I think that's what Pierre has done better than any, any politician I've seen in, in this environment, is he's telling people, I hear you, here's my answers. Now, some people might, in, in a democracy, we should always have a discussion about w- whether those answers are the best ones. But the, the very fact of the matter is, they want to hear how you know they can have more powerful paychecks, how they can see interest rates uh, normalize and be able to f- you know feed their families or feed themselves and house themselves. And so, I got to say, he's working hard, and that's really what uh, democracy is supposed to do. You're supposed to, you know, uh, democracy. Someone told me is about getting enough people to say yes. And you know, that's that's whenever the next election comes, Kent. That's that's the arguments I want to be making is is how do we get people to say yes to a new government. Thanks for saying yes to this interview. Yes, thank you for coming by. We'll have you more often if you're willing to come and put up with us. Well, originally you guys told me that you two would be the ones that would be uh, giving each other the most the, the, the hard times. That so. happens off camera. Uh, I've always wanted to just do a show with him, but he doesn't want to. <laughs> anyway, thank you for watching Kelowna Now, and uh, we'll be back with the 4 o'clock news. Thanks, guys. Thanks.